So first of all, thank you all for coming today. Uh, for those uh, who are joining us uh, for the first time, uh, AI uh, Radio is uh, one of the activities that uh, AI Slovakia uh, created a few years ago. Originally, this idea started uh, in Košice uh, on uh, uh, like Department of uh, Cybernetics and uh, AI uh, within the Faculty of uh, Electrical Engineering at uh, Technical University of Košice. Uh, the main person who originally organized these events uh, is Professor Sinčak. And uh, within cooperation uh, with uh, AI Slovakia, this uh, became one of the activities that uh, AI Slovakia uh, like included into the portfolio. For those of you who don't know uh, AI Slovakia, AI Slovakia is a national platform for AI development within Slovakia. And it uh, originally started under the name Slovak AI. Uh, both Marek and me, we were at the beginning of this uh, initiative. And uh, uh, yeah, it later like developed into uh, this organization or different name. So it evolved. And uh, also Ministry of uh, Investments, Miri, uh, like was included uh, into like uh, this organization. So uh, originally it started as academic project, but later also like state uh, become involved into uh, into all of this. So uh, thank you all for joining again. And our today's speakers uh, doesn't need to like introducing. Uh, as I see, uh, a lot of you are joining us and uh, the, mainly the speaker was the reason why you are uh, like coming. Uh, he's also uh, like uh, uh, many people like uh, call him also Slovak Elon Musk or uh, one of the like top innovators within uh, uh, Slovakia or originally from Slovakia. Uh, he's uh, like uh, a company. Uh, Good AI is one of the leading uh, uh, like companies that has nothing less uh, as a goal than like reaching strong AI or uh, the um, uh, artificial general intelligence. So the holy grail of AI development in general as the main goal and to reach it as soon as possible. So uh, yeah, the, I think that we are very lucky that he find the time and join us. So now Marek, floor is yours. Thank you, Radovan, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, we can start with uh, questions or any topic that you would like to uh, get my opinion on. So uh, first of all, uh, like the maybe if uh, nobody else is asking, maybe I will start. Uh, uh, the questions is how when like OpenAI put this uh, technology like ChatGPT uh, like on the market, what was your first reaction to this? Because they basically like stole your <laughs> stole your like goals or like come on the market with something that uh, you were working on and uh, how you, what was your first reaction on this? And that's a good question. So, um... It was uh, like, like I really had to adapt our strategy. So it was a big moment for me. It was basically the moment uh, that I was waiting for uh, for all these years. And uh, so what we were doing before ChatGPT was that we were working on uh, other uh, architectures that we thought can lead to AGI, like some evolutionary memetic evolution and, and so on. I actually didn't have much belief in uh, deep learning because I always thought that deep learning will have problem with generalization. So when I saw ChatGPT, and actually even before the ChatGPT moment, uh, we were already uh, playing with language models. And when I saw that they actually can generalize beyond what they were trained on, that, that was the moment that maybe this is the architecture that actually can then scale up to AGI and, and you know, get us further. But the ChatGPT moment, that was probably the like a turning point for me when I, really decided that 
uh, we should not be working on our own architecture, uh, kind of like competitive architectures to transformers and, and GPT models, but we should be using uh, the models uh, or we should be using existing models you know, from OpenAI or others, maybe eventually at some point build our own, but uh, we should not be working on new architectures because the ideas that we had, I think they are still good and still could work, but uh, it would probably take years, if not decades, to develop to the stage where uh, transformers already are. Plus transformers, you know, there, there is already whole ecosystems with tens of thousands or maybe million, you know, uh, developers working on it. And uh, there is hardware ecosystem and, and, and all these things. Whereas for what we were working on, memetic evolution, uh, none of this exists. So, so what we did when GPT, GPT came out uh, was that we fully decided to go this path. And uh, at the time, uh, one of the projects that we were working on in Good AI was this AI game. We call it AI people game right now. And uh, we were working on this maybe two years before uh, ChatGPT. Originally, uh, the game wasn't using the language models at all. It was just some kind of like a classical AI, you know, uh, uh, planning and, and those kind of things. But we started to add uh, language models to it uh, after some time, even before ChatGPT. But the quality of the language models wasn't great. Uh, something like, you know, like language model ge generating the function calls that was, you know, like a dream uh, at that stage. Uh, so I didn't have that much expectation. And basically, I was assuming that we will use the language model mainly to generate the conversations. But, uh, and then in like far future, use the language model to actually generate the behaviors of the agent and the, the horse uh, stories. So when we saw ChatGPT and we understood that instruction fine tuning, uh, or you know, also LHF and all these things. So basically, like when the language model doesn't just continue predicting the text that you put into the prompt, because that's how we were using it before that. But what they did with Instruct GPT and then Chat GPT uh, was that you can actually instruct language model to do something for you. And this was like a big mental switch for us because it's a completely different way of using it. You know, just like preparing prompt and then hoping that language model will kind of like predict tokens in a way that continues your text. So we switched from that to instructing. So telling the language model what it should do. So this was a huge, huge change. So we started to uh, we basically switch this game from the language models we were using before to uh, GPT 3.5, I think it was back then. And we started to play with this. The, the reliability wasn't uh, great uh, for the use case that we have in our game. So you know, like GPT sometimes was making making things up, uh, not just hallucinating, but basically ignoring the instructions, um, missing things, the context length. I think it was only 2,000 tokens back then. Something kind of funny, you know, uh, these days, and and so on. And uh, but we believed that the next version will be better, and then we can be prepared for this. And so we, we just kept working on this, and basically we switched the game from a game where a lot of the decisions and behavior of the agents were was based on planners and some kind of scripts and and, and those kind of things to uh, kind of like architecture where the behaviors of the agents and the whole story uh, is generated by a language model based on the, or conditioned on the, on the history. So basically what already happened in the game and what are the instructions in the prompt? Like basically what the agents, like what is their bio, what they can do in the game world that like interact with other agents or interact with some items and things around them and so on. And this still wasn't reliable, reliable in a GPT 3.5, but then at some point we switched or we tried GPT 4 and it became much, much better. Still not super reliable, but much, much better. And so we just continue uh, prototyping on GPT 4, assuming that at some point in the future, the cost will go down. Uh, eventually there will be GPT 5, which will make some things that are really hard for us right now, will make it easier. And also assuming that in a, in some time, uh, local models or you know like small local models, it's like seven billion uh, parameter models or even smaller models will uh, 
have the same quality as GPT-4, at least for our use case in this game, and, and you'll be able to replace it and use local models without any infrastructure costs, which is still not true. This still didn't happen. Like the local models uh, are great, but not good enough for what we need for the game. So we are still relying on GPT-4. And uh, what we did on top of this is uh, the long-term memory. And that's basically a mechanism. Uh, it's something similar to RAC, but it's not just RAC, uh, but it is the same principle that you are storing some memories uh, in, in a database and then querying them and retrieving them and inserting to the prompt. Basically, you try to retrieve the most relevant memories uh, from the memory from the long-term memory and insert them to the prompt so the, the language model with just very fixed and small context window can still predict interesting stories so another thing that we are working on and this is a very important project for us is this long-term memory and what we did is that a couple months ago we released ltm benchmark that uh, we created like a set of tasks where you can measure how any LLM or LLM agent, how good it is at um, basically remembering things that happened in the past and also reacting to the instructions. So what it does is actually is that uh, you have some tasks, for example, you will say that uh, please add X on my shopping list. Then later, even after a few days, you will select and now add bread to the shopping list. And then later, later, you will select and now tomatoes and remove the, the eggs because I already bought them on my way home. And the thing is that, uh, of course, LLM can kind of help you with this if this entire conversations, conversation fits inside context window. But if there was a lot of conversation, it will probably not fit, the, uh, fit in the context window. So basically, our LTM is bringing two benefits. Uh, and uh, one is that it's extending the context window to like, theoretically infinity because you can just be adding things to, to this LTM and then it's retrieved only with, when it's needed. So you have, in some sense, infinite context window. And the second thing is that it helps to integrate the information that is somehow spread through the conversation. And what I mean by this is that this example with the shopping list that I said, it can happen in the course of like many days. And imagine that you have a prompt which contains some conversations with the agent, you know, then mentioning the, the shopping list and some other conversation mentioning the shopping list and so on. And then at the end, basically we instruct the language model to like, uh, answer some question. For example, like what is the content of my shopping list? And what the language model needs to do in that one inference call, you know, in that one prompt is to integrate all the information that is in the prompt. And to really understand, okay, this instruction at this to shopping list uh, depends on the result of what happened before, what happened before, what happened before. And for example, if I say that delete my shopping list and start from scratch, I actually need to integrate even this instruction into the final result. So we call this integration of information and uh, LTM also helps with this. And uh, and many LLMs actually fail, fail on this because they, some people actually call this like, or there are benchmarks called like needle in the haystack or multiple needles in the haystack, like finding the needle in the haystack, meaning needle is some information, and haystack is the, the prompt. So uh, you can measure how many of these needles the LLM will actually uh, ignore uh, in your prompt. And GPT-4 is good if the prompt is up to certain size. But then it starts to, uh, to like the quality starts to uh, be reduced. And by quality, I mean the ability to retrieve and reason about information in the in the context. Cloud three uh, is like much 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 better. I, I don't want to say like hundred percent correct, but it's really good uh, in not missing the information in the context. And Gemini Pro one point five, we will we will have to test. But I have also higher hopes that it's quite good as well. So I think LLMs will become much better at uh, not missing any any information, any instruction, any fact that is in the context. But then still, the LTM will have these two benefits: that it will be integrating the information. So uh, you know, like some informations or some memories that you have. You don't need the entire history of how you get to that information. You just want the, let's say, like the summary or the or the last state. You don't need the history how, it, how you get to this. And this also, uh, I mean, 
intuitively it, it makes sense. And the second benefit is the expandability of the LTM. You know, that it doesn't have any fixed length, uh, like you know, like even Gemini has one one million tokens, but even that's that's a limited quantity. So uh, LTM will have the benefit. So how we are using LTM in the game is that. Uh, the game remembers what the agents were talking about, who did what, and you know, like all these things. And then when it's predicting or generating, you know, like next uh, story part or some part of the plot, uh, it's using all this history. Uh, hopefully, nothing is nothing important is missing, and then the story makes sense. The agent can the agents can actually learn uh, their personality can develop and so on. So yeah, sorry for the long answer, but no problem, no problem. That's very interesting because your like uniqueness to like how approach uh, reaching AGI is also in this that you are combining basically game industry. You are using games as a simulations of uh, interacting of these agents, uh, independent agents that are like uh, uh, using AI or uh, it's it's AI itself. Uh, interacting within the world. So this is really uniqueness uh, compared to like approach of open AI. So I would just add to this and maybe ask you another question. Uh, how you see, for example, Sora uh, as uh, the new coming technology, it's not public yet, but uh, uh, how their approach within like generating the video, basically simulation, or basically we can call it a dream, uh, uh, of um, uh, physics, simulating of physics and uh, interaction within the world that uh, they are like generating and how it is your approach uh, of using a game for simulation uh, different uh, from their approach, uh, how to basically learn because the like creation of their world within Sora is using for training, hopefully in future, AGI you are basically using different approach via games. So what are the differences or what you see will win? Which approach will win in the future? Uh, I think in future, it will be like Sora. So even games, so like end-to-end -end trained game simulations with characters, stories, everything. And uh, I actually had a, had a blog post where uh, like a few months ago, if somebody's interested, interested in that and they're basically like structure these or categorize these uh, based on like what frequency of simulation are we talking about so what Sora does is that they are like at the end they are doing the uh, the, the like high frequency simulation meaning that they are simulating the individual frames and pixels and everything what we are doing right now is that we are simulating only the decisions of the agents in the game world and so it's low frequency, basically, because those actions, they happen like once per few seconds. Whereas what Sora does is that it will generate, let's say, 60 frames per, per every second. And then there is uh, like a middle middle step I mean, between these like low frequency and high frequency, where uh, we'll be using AI to simulate the game logic in the, in the game world, but still not simulating the pixels, just like you know, game mechanics. So, for example, like player shot at some enemy, and now we don't want hard-coded programmed game logic to decide how much health should be, you know, like reduced from that enemy that got hit, but it should be AI that will make this decision. So we will be able to create games very easily, you know, just by prompting the, the language model, and uh, then the AI will take care of all the all the details. So that's the, the, the middle step. So again, uh, the first step that we are doing right now is low frequency simulation of the NPC behaviors, their actions in the game world. Middle ground is then the language model of AI simulating also the game logic and also keeping the state of the game, game world. And the last step I think is sim simulating also the pixels of the, of the game. And why we are not doing the last step that the Sora is doing is that it's not feasible for games uh, like this year or next few years, probably. And even the Sora, uh, for example, like I saw some Altman at some podcast, he was saying that they still have to figure out how to make Sora kind of feasible for business or, or, or scalable, because it seems that probably it's quite 
expensive to generate those videos. And for games, you actually need real time control, you know, so you cannot um, wait, I don't know, like even a few seconds. But it sounded more like, you know, it takes minutes or hours for Sora to generate the videos. And, but for games, you cannot wait, you know, like you need 60 frames per second kind of feedback. And uh, so for this reason, we are not even thinking about uh, generating also the pixels and the real time physics and so on. Uh, we'll keep that for later. Maybe there will be some, some easier ways, like, for example, I know that there is some stable diffusion that can generate, I think, like 100 frames per second or something like that. So maybe that could be used. But then all these video uh, image generation uh, techniques, they have problem with the consistency. So, so you know, every frame is like slightly different than the previous frame. And I saw that there are some solutions, so maybe we'll look on that. But right now, basically, what we are doing is that AI is only generating the behaviors, the actions, and the rest is standard game, you know, development. So, like, you know, using Unity as an engine, using rendering, like, we use all the time assets created by artists and so on. Uh, so we are doing it this way because we also need to be practical and think about when the game can be released on the product, how much it will actually cost uh, to run the inference and all these things. You cannot, you know, just like be in a dreamland and and design and develop something that nobody will be able to use. But I agree, the end game will be something like Sora, uh, where you will have AI model that was trained to simulate uh, any game, any simulation, any universe, basically. Then you will prompt it somehow, and it would be generating the frames for you. And uh, But we are going there from this angle. Uh, OpenAI is going there from more like, let's use infinite amount of data and compute, you know, and train it. I still think that our approach will be useful and not completely obsolete or abandoned later, because I think when you are generating universes, you need to have interesting stories in those universes, interesting characters, interesting NPCs. So the problems that we are solving right now on how to actually make the story generated by, by AI interesting, you know, and not just simulation, but actually interesting simulation that has some narrative uh, elements, you know, like there is some kind of like climax and uh, you're going from conflict to resolution, conflict to resolution and so on. Uh, so to make it interesting, uh, I still think these things need to be solved, you know, and then we can reuse them when we'll get to like kind of sort of uh, stage. Another big thing is that uh, this time consistency. So actually, Sora seems to be quite good at being consistent. That when you have, uh, when they are showing the videos, you know, even though they are quite short, let's say 50 seconds, 15 seconds, but even that's quite a lot. And for example, uh, the camera is changing the angle and position, and the people are walking there, and something physical is happening. It's quite solid. Uh, so it actually keeps understanding of the state of the of what it is simulating. So that's really nice. The question is if they can extend it to let's say one or two or three hours or even days, uh, day long simulation uh, that will then uh, be consistent with what happened, you know, before that. That's a, that's a big question. And uh, if they will need something like the long term memory that we are developing, or they will have some end to end trained long term memory, which actually assume that they would go that direction. So those are still big questions. And maybe I will also uh, explain uh, what what is the mission of good AI and what was the mission and what is the mission now. So the original mission was to build AGI and then use it for you know like building useful products and tools and things. And uh, so we started with the first step, build AGI, you know, but then we wanted to switch to the second step, like start using AGI for useful things. And we did the first step, or we work on the first step because nobody was working on AGI. But, but I mean, some people were, but you know, it wasn't a, a thing. There wasn't AGI, so I decided that uh, we have to build it ourselves. And but with ChatGPT and language models, I realized that this first step is not entirely solved, but it's on a good track. And it's not just us working on AGI, but now it's you know, like Microsoft, OpenAI, Google, many startups 
like many, many, many of them. So we actually don't need to be pushing that much on the building AJ part. And we can already switch to the second stage of our mission, which was to start using AI or AGI to, to develop useful products. And what this means practically for us is that I always wanted to build intelligent agents that can learn and you know, like help users or uh, be used autonomously as teams to scale up work and everything. And uh, so building intelligent agents that can learn, you know, that's our mission. And uh, building this for a game gives us the advantage that first, I'm from game industry, so I understand it. Second, there are no regulation, regulations or, or very limited regulations in AI, so we can really experiment and not be afraid, you know, with some damage or anything like that. And also iteration loops are quite good. And there are also some disadvantages, for example, like running the language model for predicting the uh, characters in our game is actually quite expensive. And so there are also some disadvantages. And but still, I think it's good. And uh, I think that the agents that we develop for the game, agents with long term memory, will then be useful in other domains, you know, when we will switch uh, to more universal uh, agents. And actually, we are also doing this. Like, there is one team in uh, Good AI working on uh, assistant, we call, call it uh, Charlie Mnemonic. So you can think about like GPT, but with long term memory. So you say something you know, some information about you and it remembers it. But not just that, it also remembers the instructions. So if you tell it that every time I ask you about, I ask you to write email, for example, do it in this style, and then you don't need to repeat it. Uh, so imagine like having some kind of like Batman, he has his, um, um, what is his name, Alfred, you know, his butler Alfred. And whatever you say to your Alfred, in our case, Charlie Mnemonic, uh, the agent should remember. And basically through instructions, you align the you align the agent to yourself incrementally and continually. That's the idea. That basically ChatGPT is not aligned to you. ChatGPT is aligned with some average person. But and somehow it's also not aligned with many of us because there are questions where ChatGPT doesn't want to answer, you know, because ethical reasons or whatever, but doesn't want to answer. But what I think is actually needed is that agent that you can, through talking to it, instructing it, uh, that you can align with your goals, you know, whatever your, your, your kind of like personality is, and that it will be almost like extension of your will. That's, I think, uh, the type of agent that we need. And yeah, that's what we are working on. So maybe also a big, big um, or important topic to mention is that uh, because we are not uh, or when ChatGPT came out, I really had to decide what will be, like, choose your battle, basically. Like, are we going to build our own GPT and try to compete with OpenAI, you know, when they have, like, much more resources and, and, and team that already proved that they are good at developing uh, GPT models and so on. So I was thinking about what should be, um, what should be our competitive advantage and also our niche. Uh, and so on, and the long-term memory seems like one of those things because nobody or almost nobody is actually working on that. So, so that's what we are working on. But then other things we can use uh, what is already available in the ecosystem. Like, you know, we are using GPT models that we think are suitable. We don't need to develop our GPT model right now, but maybe in the future, you know, maybe we can think about our own language model that will be somehow integrated with long-term memory and for the game, actually, you would need language model that is not so censored as GPT-4. Because it's quite annoying, to be honest, when you want to have a game with some dramatic you know, situation, with some kind of extreme characters, you know, like people being angry or happy and so on. And GPT is always, or GPT-4 is always, always trying to turn everybody into like some collaborative, happy person. So many times the stories, they don't end up with like everybody killing everybody, you know, like a proper drama should should be. But it's more like, let's talk about this, let's discuss this, let's cooperate together for a better future, you know, <laughs> those kind of stories, which is not not super entertaining. So having language model that is not uh, brainwashed uh, to be, you know, like so good, uh, but actually is able to uh, emulate even like really evil characters, uh, that's something that uh, we will need to solve 
in in near future. And uh, in the future, you see as multimodality as the next step, or will it be the larger models, uh, larger and larger, or the specialty into maybe smaller language models uh, focused on like uh, uh, maybe to solve concrete uh, like uh, solution within based on profession, for example, LLM focused for uh, like a physician or a focus for economists or focus for lawyers. What's the next step? How you see it that uh, the usefulness of these large language models that are basically semi-product of the AGI uh, process, uh, how you see usefulness and what is what will be the next modality that will probably will be added? Will it be like a mimic or uh, uh, like gestures or what will be the next step from your point of view? So I think multimodality is like super important and probably one of the key components to unlocking better generality of these models, better, you know, capabilities, performance and everything. And now you have Gemini that can already do videos. And it's amazing in my opinion, because it opens completely new use cases that are impossible without it. Like in theory, you can record what you are doing on your computer send it to Gemini and start reasoning about it, right? Like you cannot do this with text. You will have to describe everything, but it's kind of impossible to describe everything. And even if you describe everything that you are doing on your computer, uh, the instructions would be missed in the context anyway. So uh, I think uh, video is amazing multimodality. And then there will be some other modalities like uh, being grounded in some physical simulation. So, for example, DeepMind, they, they have this paper uh, called SIMA, and uh, where this is actually quite funny because I, I must mention it, but they are also training on space engineers, you know, like the game that we developed. And what they are doing is that they have some agent uh, that is then playing these games. And I believe that their end goal is also to like try all these modalities, maybe independently, but then eventually merge it into one model where you know it, it was trained on text, images, audio, videos, but also playing some, some games, maybe seeing people using uh, the, the browser or you know, just desktop. Probably there will be also something like uh, what's this like self-play uh, that was in AlphaGo. So basically generating even more synthetic data by let, letting the model kind of like play and try some things. So I think that will be there. So eventually you will get some really maybe big model. Maybe those models will be smaller in the future that uh, people will discover ways how to uh, like uh, compress them even more. But I still think that the most capable models will be models that will be trained on the biggest amount of data, high quality data uh, can be synthetically generated uh, and as multimodal as possible. I think those models, not LLMs, you know, they will be kind of like a multimodal models or language models. I think they will have the highest um, quality, most capabilities. And I think that they will then perform better even on this specialized task that you mentioned. You know, and that's the true even right now that for this task, like lawyer or doctor, it's much better to ask GPT-4 than to ask some specialized model because all these other information or other modalities add some special information to the training process that actually helps unlock some other capability or some, some skill. So I actually don't think that there will be specialized models unless we really talk about some like distant uh, or not, maybe not so distant future where this large, like these super, super large models will be creating specialized versions of themselves. They're good and specialized, optimized only for some domain, but you will have to do it through some process of distillation and uh, it will really need to be controlled process. For example, you can then say that, okay, we train something like, let's say GPT-4, but we care only about it knowing about, let's say, lawyer, um, you know, profession, nothing else. 
But actually, this doesn't mean that you can be a lawyer because lawyer also needs to understand physics, at least to a certain level, like, right? You need to understand that if somebody is killed, you know, what it means, or that you can kill a person like this many ways. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a murder and there, there are law against, uh, laws against that and so on. So you cannot really say that we can remove everything from the uh, parameters of the model and keep only like the lawyer parameters because many of the things that lawyer needs are actually spread out like outside of this space. So I think uh, maybe you can then say that, okay, the lawyer model doesn't need to know anything about the history. But then the question is that, okay, so yeah, it doesn't need to know like very specific details about the history, but maybe the model still should know, you know, what happened in 20th century, at least the basic things. Or maybe that there was Roman Empire, you know, and the, the law is based on the Roman law and, and, and these things. So I think it's hard to set the boundaries of what does need to be remembered, stored in the parameters, and, and what has to be. So I don't know, to be honest, uh, if... Uh, because many of these use cases, uh, like, you know, having a lawyer AI or, or a doctor AI work only when the model has capabilities cert, like above certain threshold. You can, below the threshold, it's un unacceptable. Like you cannot use it. The quality is not good enough. And it seems to me that only these very, very large models with as many modalities as possible will be able to cross the threshold. And then there is another question, which is actually, Imagine that you can use some small model that runs cheaply, uh, but the capabilities are, are limited to a certain degree. Or next to it, you have like the latest model from OpenAI or Google that maybe the inference will cost more, but the capabilities that it opens for you are much larger. And now the question is like, which of these would you employ? And now think about it from a different perspective. If I was talking about people like here, you would have some person with, let's say, and this will maybe sound nasty, but IQ 70, but it will be cheap person, right? And here will be person with IQ 200, but his salary will be double, 10 times more. Like which of these two people would you rather hire? Probably this one, because uh, the multiplying effect that that person can bring to you or that model can bring to you is like much higher than the difference between the their salaries, basically. And so what I think actually is that uh, the company that will develop the model with the highest capability will dominate the market. Plus, they will be able to use the model for themselves for developing the next generation of the model and basically kind of like like run away, you know, from their competition. So I don't know. Uh, I don't have much. Let's say. I think the smaller models will still be used for, for something, but I also see this trend of bigger, better, more expensive models having capabilities that unlock some new features as something that will be actually pushing the evolution of language models and, and opening new doors. And basically that's the area where I'm more interested, not how to make something like low performance things, making it cheaper. I'm more interested in like maybe more expensive, but opening new possibilities. And uh, basically, what do you think that which philosophy will win? Basically, OpenAI has open in the name, but it's one of the most closed companies like within the world, even within like ChatGPT. Do you think that the philosophy of openness or open source open sourcing these technologies, these LLMs, these uh, potential like uh, semi steps towards AGI is a better one or the future you see in a, like closed uh, large language models or specialized smaller language models, which philosophy open or closed systems will win uh, in like reaching AGI maybe in the future? I think the closed one. I mean, I would like to say the open one because it will be better for you know, the democracy and some kind of uh, diversification variety uh, um, in this universe. But I think the closeness 
is giving those who can then exploit it benefits and then they can accelerate faster. And uh, if you look at, around us even now, you see that people who have certain greed uh, are usually more successful, at least like financially, than people who give up uh, or give away everything uh, they have. So I think, uh, and I'm saying this as a practical person, you know, like again, if this, if I was just talking about my ideal, I would say, of course, open uh, should be better because it would create more diversity in the, in the society, in, in the universe. And it would actually create more stable uh, and more resilient civilization than uh, if there are some closed systems. But unfortunately, you know, this is how the reality works. And uh, so I think the companies that are closed uh, will keep their advantage and use it to even like increase uh, their advantage. So that's what I think is the reality. Hopefully, uh, there will be more closed companies than just one, because if it is just one, uh, we are going to, you know, like a, almost like a totalitarian uh, situation when there is just one entity that has access to intelligence or like this high level intelligence. And uh, and there is no competition, there is no market. So I hope it will be more companies. There will probably be always one that will be ahead. I think you know that's the the reality of things that you don't have everybody progressing at the same pace. But there is one you know that is really ahead, some kind of overlap. And but then hopefully there will be other that will be kind of catching up, and then also the open system, open source ecosystem will be also catching up. That's what I hope. Maybe if you then look on how the power, so not just the access to intelligence, but the actual power, you know, to change things in the real world, how it's distributed among these actors, I hope it will be actually distributed uh, through people uh, who will not belong to just this one closed group uh, entity, but it will be spread out more equally or if not equally, I mean, it definitely will not be equally, at least it will be some kind of multipolar world. So not unipolar, unipolar where there is just one you know, strong uh, leader, but there are many and you need to keep things in equilibrium. You need to negotiate with others and try uh, for, basically you need to cooperate with others, you know, and not just dominate them. So that would be, that would be nice. Maybe we'll be surprised. On the other hand, maybe there will be open source data sets. Uh, maybe there will be open source uh, training procedures. Maybe there will be some group of people that will put together so much hardware and then train some model and, and make it open source that it will actually be better than some closed source competitors. So like specifically, this could mean that imagine that, uh, you know, like there was this thing for the UFO signal, uh, what was the name? Uh, SETI, SETI at home, right? Mm -hmm. So SETI at home, and there are some similar projects where they have grid computing and you know people can contribute with their uh, CPU and then they calculate. So I know that there are projects like this for uh, training uh, GPTs. So imagine that uh, millions of people contribute their uh, CPU to these computers and imagine that the training actually can leverage this distributed network and is not bottlenecked by it. Uh, then maybe, you know, uh, this distributed network of people can have more training power than OpenAI. And then maybe the final language model that they would develop and would be completely open source would be, uh, would have higher quality. That would be nice. That would be nice. And maybe also another angle that I'm sometimes thinking about is that, you know, like, for example, fire, uh, like somebody had to invent fire and many other technologies in the past. Like somebody had to have the idea, like some first person had to have the idea how to, let's say, like capture the fire or then later create the fire. But now it's a common knowledge. Nobody thinks about this. We are not paying, you know, like uh, infrastructure costs or, or any kind of price to the person who invented fire because the person is like long forgotten. Uh, and uh, as I said, anybody can, can create fire and use fire. And uh, so my question is, if with language models or AI models, we will not get to similar stage 
quite soon that you know like having just like I can go outside you know get some some wood and make a fire I mean I will probably still need you know some lighter or something like that but in worst case I can just you know do it with rocks but probably it would take me like a few hours to, to do it because you know like I'm not used to do it but uh, in theory I could do it in a few hours if I really tried and I would think about the principles how you know like fire works I could do it uh, so the question is, if you will be in similar situation with language models, that basically I will use tools that will be available to me and train my own language model without worrying that I need to pay, you know, some royalty fees to this one or that one. Basically, I would just uh, use language models like I use Fire. That's a question that I have. But then again, if this happens and regular people have access to something like I described, the question is, if at the moment OpenAI will not be already like five, step, five steps ahead. Yeah, a few years back, thank you for the answer. A few years back, you organized or co-organized um, a New York company was the main organizer of uh, like human level AI conference, which is basically free academic conference together each uh, year on different continent. Basically one of the biggest conferences that I have attended in my life uh, so far. And uh, one of the main speakers there was Ben Gretzel, like the author of Sophia, first humanoid, uh, like uh, globally that even got uh, citizenship uh, by, uh, I think, Saudi Arabia or some uh, countries like that. Uh, uh, his vision was uh, basically com combination of technologies. Uh, one of the like uh, technologies that he used or his philosophy was about was blockchain. Do you see that his vision uh, that uh, reaching AI uh, within uh, like uh, next few years or within a decade uh, that will be open and for benefit of the whole, human whole humanity, not just the closed software that the benefiter is the creator or the company that comes with it. Do you think that his philosophy and his like approach within blockchain is even possible or relevant in this like new world after uh, OpenAI uh, came with uh, their technologies and based on Azure, Microsoft, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, that's one of the question. And the other question is: Is uh, the like AGI or the vision of AGI is it just software or is it like combination of uh, also hardware? like uh, was the vision from Hanson Robotics and uh, Ben's vision? Or will it be just like uh, it is now, just software? So, so uh, starting from the back, uh, I think AGI also uh, needs robotics. And luckily, there is nice progress uh, in last few months, you know, like the Optimus robot from uh, Tesla. And there are many other startups uh, that have interesting uh, progress. And again, they are using some transformers or real-time transformers uh, to do so. So I think uh, I think actually uh, there will be AGI in a few years. I'm quite convinced now. And by AGI, I mean something that can do tasks like any other person and can learn uh, to do tasks as any other person. There will probably be differences between this AGI and real people because uh, because like, we learn things during our lifetimes, whereas uh, GPT models they are trained on a lot of data, you know, uh, much more data than you could experience as a person. So there are basically big differences. And I think interesting question could be what is missing from the current technology that needs to be added to call it AGI. I think that, that's interesting. Uh, that can be an interesting discussion. But back to your question with uh, blockchain and, and the other things. So uh, I think this is more about not about development of the technology, but about how it can then be, let's say, used for the benefit of society and the civilization. And my answer here would be that I don't necessarily want to comment on what Ben Gertzel was saying, because I don't know enough you know, about this vision. But I would say what I think, uh, what I personally think, uh, am thinking about. So what I think is that 
actually we need to start structuring the civilization in a way that it will be open to accept and adapt to this new technology that will come and to many more challenges uh, that will come. Uh, so internally, we are working on something that we call uh, resilient civilization. So civilization that is actually resilient towards some errors or um, problems and can actually keep experimenting widely without worrying that one wrong experiment will end the civilization. And at the same time, the civilization has some kind of safety net to individuals in the civilization, like individual people. So we don't need to worry that uh, if AI will take our jobs at some point, you know, that you will just die uh, from hunger, or that if somebody will uh, create stronger AGI than you have, that they will kill you, and so on. So civilization is something that keeps the safety net for everybody, but also is open to different kinds of work functioning, different kinds of uh, values, and uh, accelerates the, the development of the civilization itself. So this is how I'm thinking about it. And now the tools, how this can be achieved, or how the, this civilization can be designed, and then uh, how it can be developed, what tools we need for it. Maybe blockchain will be one of the answers, maybe. And uh, what actually I think about is that we will change the economy, or the economy will change uh, dramatically. Not in everything. I still think that greed will drive things. I still think that you will want uh, ownership to maintain the ownership of things, you know, that we don't want to go to socialism. And uh, I still think that we don't need something like money, you know, to, to basically communicate the value uh, independent of like what is the current asset and so on. But I think what can change is actually how the governments and countries work. So right now, uh, when we elect the government and the president, uh, we do it because we need some people who will then represent us and lead the country and then actually they rule us in some sense so it's interesting uh, um, mechanism where you have people voting the government but the government at the same time kind of like influencing some control over the people so it's hard to say if the people are controlling the government or the government is controlling the people like in theory it's people controlling the government but in reality it doesn't work always like that and so what I'm thinking, we need to start thinking about with uh, human level AI or maybe even superhuman level AI, is that maybe we should actually have something like AI government where we will vote for what language model or for, for what model we want to run our country, what the values of the country should be, that for example, some country will want to have like democracy, uh, some kind of social state, so everybody has access to you know some basic uh, services, and then at the same time, this air government would be actually also providing the services to the, to the people. So we, it will not need human policemen, human uh, like people at the offices and so on, but it will be AI doing these things for us. The benefit will be that things could be more transparent without, uh, without um, like some people exploiting the system for their own benefit. And... Uh, in this sense, I think uh, we can have government or a government that really works for us, you know, and not the other way. Uh, another benefit that I see is that if you think about it from an economic stance, uh, right now, economy is based on three, three elements. So it's uh, labor, capital, and resources, or natural resources. And next few years, I think the labor, labor will be replaced by AI. And so you will only need capital and resources to you know, build some products and services and some money. And now think about this for the government and the state. So our state, uh, let's say Slovak Republic, you can think about it like a company that is owned by all 5 million people who are citizens of Slovakia. We don't need to vote human politicians to represent us. We can just vote for what kind of AI, what kind of values we want to represent us. It is the access to natural resources that are in our country. And then with the AI, uh, it can actually uh, develop, uh, with the AI and robots, it can actually provide the services and products for us. And so instead of us paying you know, taxes to the government, it can go the other way. It can be our, you know, almost like our slave 
or our servant working for us and giving uh, services and products to everybody in the country. This is something like the universal basic income, of course. Uh, maybe just a different variation of it, but I think it's something very similar to this. But again, you really need to stop using the old way of thinking about the economy and what is the role of the state, where it's like, I start my company, I pay taxes, I don't want to pay taxes. And also, I mean, I'm okay to pay taxes because I live here, but at the same time, I know that I'm forced to pay taxes, you know, based on some rules that I don't understand, our lawyers understand, our accountants understand, but I don't understand those rules, but I'm forced by force to pay those taxes. Whereas uh, if we have uh, a government, a government that has the natural resources of the country, if, instead of human labor is using AI and has capital, because my country still has some capital, can then provide products and services for the citizens of the country and doesn't even need to take taxes from the people and companies in that country. And it can still work, I think. And so what I'm doing is that I'm thinking in this direction. Uh, so not just developing AI and developing AI products, but actually how to structure the society and the civilization. And then eventually even some AI governments or AI countries that will literally work for us. Not that we work for them, because right now it feels to me like, like I'm developing games, making money, paying taxes, you know, so that I don't get to jail for not paying the taxes. That's how, how it feels right now. And it can feel the other way. It can feel that the government is actually working for me. So, uh, yeah, that's the longer answer. And, and, and uh, we need to yeah. structure it into some proper uh, blog post or something like that, because when I'm saying it like this, probably not very structured. So in coming weeks or months, uh, we'll, we'll want to release it. Uh, at least the fault, you know, and start the discussion that we can actually start thinking about something like this. And uh, don't you think that there will be like power struggle between already established elites and uh, these systems? Because what you are saying is uh, basically the disruption will be not just in business, but in society in general, in a basically structure of democracy. Is this the end of democracy or uh, just the beginning of the new age, new AI era age of uh, basically uh, AI will be involved even within the highest level of our democracies will be our servant or uh, this is the end of the old world and uh, yeah. I think it's a new type of democracy. It's let's say like a democracy with higher quality because we already have democracy like we can vote and so on. Uh, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, our ancestors, they couldn't even vote. You know, they were just born. They were working for some you know, king or some aristocrat or somebody, and they couldn't even vote. So I wouldn't call that democracy. Uh, now we have democracy, but what are this AI democracy or AI governments can be the next stage, which is much cleaner democracy. And uh, I think there will definitely be power struggle, especially in some countries where you really have autocratic uh, government. And so I think this model, if it is a good model, maybe it's not, but if it is a good model, I think it will uh, happen or come to existence in countries that have more democratic and open institutions where the, basically where there will be like a lesser uh, power struggle from the existing establishment. Uh, and I can be very specific, like I don't expect, for example, that this would start in Russia, right? Like this probably the last country where this AI uh, government uh, would come to existence. Maybe it will start in some more democratic, open-minded countries. Uh, I don't know, maybe Switzerland or, you know, countries like that. Maybe it will actually start in some autocratic countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, because if the current king decides that he wants to go this direction, then it's done, like, you know. He doesn't need to have any discussions. And maybe he will want, because maybe instead of paying hundreds of thousands uh, employees who are governing the state, maybe he would rather have like some AI to govern the state for him and for his citizens, but, but still uh, it will be better quality services, more transparent and so on. And so I definitely expect power struggles, but 
I think the advantage is that the people who have the power is actually the citizens, especially if they are not manipulated. So I think this is a very important thing, is that if the people really understand that they can elect some AI that will really do good things for them, they should then vote for the AI and not for some you know, like dictator who just wants to exploit them, use them, and so on. So if the people are not manipulated, then they have huge power. Because even in Slovakia, you know, there's five, five million people, and there is just few, let's say, thousand of people who would be in these old uh, structures. And it's five million people against few thousand people. So like, it's quite clear who will win, except in reality, of course, those few pe few thousand people have ways how to manipulate the rest of the people, uh, you know, like through PR, but also through exploiting the institutions in some, some sense. So I think one of the things that AI will need to help is actually come with a good plan how to uh, present this idea to people and how to have them accept it and uh, on good terms without any manipulation, really being transparent and honest and so on. So, but again, I think it will start in some countries. We'll have new kind of countries, new kind of governments. For example, I never understood, I mean, I understand it from a practical perspective, but why the country has always the monopoly over some region? Like why I cannot, why can there cannot be some bigger overlap, you know? So it's like, I don't know, Google, for example, is multinational, company that okay it's it's incorporated in us but actually it's spread for entire world but let's say czech republic has the authority over only over the area of czech republic and not even one meter outside of it. and i i would rather live in a world where it's there is like more overlap of various influences and rules and yeah, and anyway, we need to think about this more. And and uh, the umbrella term that we are using is is to how to basically thinking about building resilient civilization, where all these things can be happening, experimentation can happen, and there is safety net for you know people who just want to live their life. They don't want to do some dangerous things or great things, and yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marek, for your answers and also for your vision for the future. Uh, that's all the questions that I prepared. So let's uh, like uh, let also the audience to ask you any questions. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, whoever uh, Marek selects after the questions are asked, uh, uh, the winner will win also uh, one book from uh, O'Reilly, uh, Focus on AI. So this is your chance to ask uh, Marek uh, whatever you want. You can uh, put it into the chat uh, on the on this like Zoom platform, or you can just unmute yourself and uh, ask directly. So up to you. Like ten or fifteen minutes we have, so feel free to ask. There is already a question from Dushan Urban. The question is, mm -hmm. when do you think we will achieve AGI and how will we know it? So uh, that's a good question. And I would say what is missing from AGI? Uh, so what is missing is models that are more multimodal than what we have right now. So I think, for example, video as modality in Gemini is a very good start, but we need more. Uh, we need uh, AI models that were trained on physical uh, simulations, in real world or in simulation, you know, uh, any of those. So that's that's still missing uh, because then the AI cannot form some kind of representations that are still needed. So I think more multimodality is what is missing. Another uh, component that is missing is this um, ability to learn continually or long-term memory. So basically having a model that uh, has some experiences from the environment or from the user, learns from it, aligns to it, you know, like um, adapts to it, and then continues, uh, you know, to the next step, next step, and so on. So ability to learn continually or gradually, I think that's missing. Uh, and uh, one solution could be some long-term memory, but maybe there are also better solutions. So ability to learn continually, 
think that's what is needed. What else? I think from practical perspective, it needs to uh, language models or AI models need to become faster and cheaper so they can generate more tokens per second than what they do now. Even though there are models that can generate like hundreds of tokens per second. So I think the trend is quite nice. Uh, but also the cost, you know, that uh, the cost and the electricity in consumption uh, needs to go down to be widely used. Then uh, the models will need to be trained on new kind of data that is more focused on, again, ag agentic uh, tasks. So being able to come up with a plan, start executing it, uh, reflect on it, criticize it, continue executing the plan, and so on. Uh, GPT-4 and other models, they kind of can do this, but it's very unreliable and, and still not, not uh, good to be used. So uh, models, and you probably need some new data sets for these synthetic data sets that are better at agentic uh, tasks. And then another one is ability to or increase the quality of attending to tokens in the context window and the reasoning about the tokens in the context window. So not missing tokens that are in the context window. That's very important. Like, so imagine that you have a prompt that is, let's say, 100,000 tokens, and, and there are some important instructions inside of it. And if you see that the language model ignores some of it, then you simply cannot use it, right? Because it's very unreliable for you. So increasing precision at which it attends and reasons about tokens in the context. I think that's very important. What else? I, I think there are a few things, because actually I was thinking about this myself recently. Um, yeah, so, so let's say this is the list. And now the question is when uh, they can be solved or achieved. I think some of these things will be solved just by scaling up the current uh, processes. So I would say a few years. Uh, and uh, for example, the multimodality uh, and also the precision, the context window, because it seems that they are really increasing. Uh, so probably a few years. With the long-term memory or continual learning, it's hard to say. Also, maybe it will not be so needed in the use cases where we will use the AGI. So maybe it will not be full AGI, but it will be AGI enough for you know, like programming games for you, doing research, science, and so on. Then uh, we, so I, I actually, I personally expect that we will have something like AGI that I can use, just like I can work with other people instead of I will work with this AGI agent. I expect it will be in three years or five years. That, that's my expectation, basically. That or maybe it will be a model where I will question whether I should do this task with a person or rather with agent, because with agent, maybe it will be faster, cheaper, le less confusions, and so on. So I, I expect this to be three or five years. And uh, then we get to the next stage, which is using this AGI to develop you know, like better AGI and better AGI, so some kind of recursive self improvement, and eventually reaching superhuman uh, intelligence or like super intelligence. And uh, that's a moment actually where I think, like, I'm against all these like pause AI or stop AI and pan AI and all, all those for me crazy regulations, but. I think that when we will be in a regime where we are going from human level AI to superhuman level AI, I think we need to be very careful and there needs to be some regulation of making sure that somebody doesn't develop super intelligence that is dangerous and giving too much power to that intelligent agent or to the people controlling, if they can control, uh, controlling the intelligent, super intelligent agent. I think it's to be, uh, we need to be careful because I want to build resilient civilization and that is aligned with the current humanity trajectory. And I don't want to create, you know, like civilization. Or I don't want to end up in a situation where we have one super intelligent agent that is dominating, you know, humanity and, and the universe and everything. I would still like a lot of diversity in the universe. So, um, 
when going from human level AGI to uh, super intelligence, I think uh, the society will need to be very careful. And that's something that I think will be bottlenecked by these regulations, like, like super intelligent regulations, and also by the iteration cycles. So when the AGI will come up with some new idea, will make experiments, run those experiments, learn from those experiments, make another iterations. You know, like this will not happen in a second, like this will take time. And if it will uh, be about real world experiments, let's say like developing new materials and new robots and so on, it will take a lot of time to get through one iteration. So we cannot expect, you know, that uh, getting to AGI will take years, but then from AGI to super intelligence will take one second or one day. It will probably take longer. So uh, to sum it up, I expect AGI language models or models in three or five years with some limitations. And uh, then let's say AGI that will do the same things like a person uh, that basically when thinking uh, whether I should still do the thing with that AGI or with the real humans, I would prefer AGI because it will be cheaper and it will do the same things as people. I, I'm quite sure this will happen, like at least uh, not not long, not longer than ten years. Yeah, and um, I think what this question is: what will be the cost of those models? You know, like how much it will cost. But then again. People are also very expensive, so so you know like you can always benchmark it with that, uh, and also having AI that you can easily clone, AI that works twenty four seven has other benefits that uh, people don't have. And uh, the question also was about how we will know it if we achieve AGI. So I think we will know it basically when the agent will be able to do things that a human can do. And you can know this by testing it on various tasks that uh, you would expect people can do. And when you will find out that the AGI is not failing on these tasks, then I think you know that uh, it's AGI. There will probably still be people who will be saying that it's not AGI because it cannot do this or that. But I'm talking more about the majority of useful use cases and things that we actually care about. Like if I will have AGI that can write a new game for me in a week and I can iterate with it in like every few minutes, I can have new iteration of the game. But for example, for some reason, the game cannot be about, I don't know, it can do only, let's say, real-time strategies and will not do first-person shooters. It's still super useful agent for me, right? And then we can think about where even this other uh, limitation will be removed. But yeah, full AGI needs to be able to do the same things that uh, people can do. And I expect this to be in, in five years. Perfect, perfect, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Just unmute yourself and ask directly. We can have one or two other questions. Yeah, there is one. So, uh, the yeah, long I one, the long, long one, you see it, but I will like uh, read it. What do you think about training data being degraded uh, through time? For example, if more and more authors use AI model to write or help write their papers and uh, researches, uh, and AI makes little mistakes or just not uh, clearances that can be not uh, very important in case of single research, but cumulatively through the time they can make data worse. Can this affect the future models that can possibly be trained on this new data and increase probability of mistakes and how this can affect human knowledge? What people will when people will blindly believe in AI generated answers more and more throughout or through time, uh, it was asked by Ivan Tkachenko. So, uh, what is your reaction? Yeah, I think it's a good question. So, simple answer is that I actually don't worry about this because I think that in the future we will rely more and more on synthetic data that will have some ground truth, uh, that will 
kind of guarantee you know that uh, it's not being um, um, damaged or degraded by the real world data. And uh, so, for example, like imagine language model being trained on some game, uh, you know, just playing the game, solving all the puzzles and problems in the game, and so on. And I think that language models will actually understand that the knowledge they have, uh, let's say about some historical facts, are just opinions in some sense, or that, you know, so like, for example, I know that, let's say, when the, uh, when the Second World War ended, you know, and, and there is some date, you know, let's say, uh, I forgot exactly which date it is, but, you know, like we learn these things in, in the school. And if somebody will tell me that, no, no, the Second World War actually ended on this other date, what it means for me that I will start thinking about like, okay, maybe he's right. And then I will realize that actually Second World War ended at different dates for different countries, right? Because everybody like sees it differently. And so for some countries, the world kind of continued still for some country or the beginning of Second World War, like somewhere actually I saw one discussion with one uh, professor of history, and he was saying something like the First World War started in like 1936 or five or something like that. And I was like, what? Like, I, I, I don't know about this. But he was probably talking about, I don't know, like situation in Asia or something like that. So, uh, so again, all the information that I have in my head, I take with some uh, grain of salt. And I'm not 100% sure about it. It's just like something that, you know, like I have some certainty coefficient for it. And I think the language models will need to do the same thing. And then it doesn't matter that their training is damaged by like all kinds of weird opinions. And uh, because maybe also the language models, what they will mainly do is the, they will learn the general capabilities and skills, like for example, learning from context. But the actual facts, then they can retrieve and research using different methods and, and different processes. So, like for example, if I ask ChatGPT, uh, when did the first world war started, it will give me some date. And uh, but maybe actually I want to ask it some other question, and then it will do some research. And after five minutes, it will give me the answer, and it will say something like, "Yes, according to this, it started at that date." These other historian is saying that it started some other day and so on and so on. But I can ask more complicated questions about biology and it will have to actually do research to give me the answer. So I think not all answers can be just answered from like you know from 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 the memory. Some questions need to be researched, analyzed, and maybe actually checked against some ground truth. So I'm not worried about this. And I think more and more of the data in the future will be synthetic data, not the real world human data. Okay, so which one of these questions should be awarded by book is the last question that I had on you. Uh, the first one. I think the, they both okay. were two questions, but yeah, I would pick the first one. So congratulations, Dushan, you are getting the book. And uh, that's it. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, thanks again, Marek, for finding the time uh, also for uh, like coming online. He will also come for those who are interested uh, in person on physical meetup. It will be under a different brand or uh, PyData Slovakia. And it will be on 11th of May at uh, Faculty of Electrotechnics and Informatics in Bratislava. So uh, mark the date, and if you want to meet and ask Marek also in person, we will gladly like see you on the, this day. So 11th of uh, May, and uh, so far we set it as 2 p.m., but you will be informed afterwards. So thanks again, and hopefully see you soon and also in person. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thanks for the questions. Bye-bye.